Confronting the Self in the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. That's all I think about these days. Must be because I have so much time to kill every day. When you don't have anything to do, your thoughts get really, really far out. So far out, you can't follow them all the way to the end. Join us today as we confront the self and even touch upon Japan's unwillingness to observe its past war atrocities in the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. I'm your host, Zach. Now please, sit back and enjoy this episode of Lit Tips. Now, to understand the Wind Up Bird Chronicle, we're first going to have to examine its author, Haruki Marikami. Marikami is a best-selling author known for exploring themes of Kafka-esque proportions. These themes usually boil down into two major elements, alienation and loneliness. Much to the chagrin of the Japanese literary establishment, Marikami is profoundly influenced by Western literature, admiring writers from Chandler to Vonnegut. His work often takes the form of the surreal, following protagonists possessed by a fatalistic worldview. Marikami's work has influenced much in popular culture, inspiring many of his contemporaries in film, television, and literature. Most notable, and one of our favorites here at Lit Tips, is Hong Kong filmmaker Wong Kar Wai. Kar Wai embodies Marikami as he finds the simple poetry in life and despair through long, cynical musings and hopeless meandering. Marikami wrote The Wind Up Bird Chronicle while living in the U.S. In a Salon interview, Marikami framed the way he combined his viewpoints. When I was writing my other books in Japan, I just wanted to escape. Once I got out of my country, I was wondering, what am I? What am I as a writer? I'm writing books in Japanese, so that means I'm a Japanese writer. So what is my identity? The Wind Up Bird Chronicle fully exemplifies the hopeless protagonist, futilely searching for meaning, both in a real and dream world, neither of which he truly understands. And of course, the cry of an undetected bird that foreshadows danger, giving the novel its name. Wind Up Bird Chronicle follows Toru Okada as he recently quit his job as a legal assistant at a law firm and we find him unemployed, possessing no real direction in life. Toru shares a small house and quaint lifestyle with his wife, Komiko. They have no children but share a cat who they jokingly name after Komiko's brother, Noboru Wataya, because it walks like him and both share similar eyes. Toru resides in a purgatory-like suburbia, haunted by an old house with a dark past, where those who have once lived there have met horrible fates. The abandoned house's backyard possesses a deep, dry well, which strangely piques the curiosity of Toru. When their cat goes missing, Komiko takes the news especially hard as the cat was gifted to them upon their wedding, and in many ways symbolizes their union. One could surmise the cat was one of the few responsibilities that gave their relationship meaning. It's also significant to note Toru's lack of ambition and career is especially taboo in Japan's industrious culture, where the role of masculinity is often mm. defined by working long hours, making lots of money, and supporting a family. Toru does none of the above and instead finds himself staying home taking care of the domestic duties, cooking and cleaning, and relying on his wife, a magazine editor, to support their small household. The lack of meaning is prevalent in Toru, as he realizes that he was easily replaceable in his job, but even after he quits, he shows no true signs of motivation or passion for anything substantial in life. In fact, Komiko is the only true motivating force for Toro throughout the novel, leading him on a journey of self-exploration and ultimate transcendence of his worldview. Komiko comes from a highly esteemed Japanese family, who never supported her marriage to Toru. Her father was a highly esteemed government official, and her brother, Noboro Wataya, is a highly successful academic and political commentator who eventually follows his father's footsteps towards public office. 
However, Komiko and Noboro's sister committed suicide years ago for an undisclosed reason that is only revealed later in the novel. As Toru and Komiko search for the cat, Komiko reaches out to her brother, who in turn recommends the assistance of a clairvoyant Malta Kano, though the cat remains lost. Toru is the exact opposite of Noboro in every way. He lacks ambition and possesses a small world view, whereas Noboro is cruel, cold, and violent, not to mention he also has a strange sexual perversion that is revealed he enacted on both his sisters and prostitutes such as Multicano's sister, Krita. It's not long after when the cat disappears when Komiko also vanishes. Used to his wife working long hours, Toru isn't immediately worried. However, when she fails to come home that night, the next morning he retraces his wife's actions and seeks out her brother and then the help of Multicano. Toru discovers that Komiko wants a divorce and to never see him again. She had been having an affair with an older man leading her to a venereal disease and an unfathomable self-hatred. This drives Toru into the brink of chaos, some may argue, his life was always destined for. This brings us to the dry well. Upon being thrust into chaos, Toru's mind races incessantly, but there is no clear way to get Komiko back, and therefore his life back. It is only the dry well where he is able to achieve the complete realization of his thoughts. Now let's look at some of the physical qualities of the well. It's deep, cold, and dark. All of these features close out the rest of the active world, allowing Toru to devolve completely into a meditative state. Toru also develops an inky black mark on his face that gives him some mysterious healing power, which is ironic because he is unable to heal his own pain. We must also note, Toru is not the only character to find himself within a deep, dried out well. When Toru and Komiko were still together at the insistence of her family, they would visit a fortune teller, Mr. Honda, who was also a veteran of the Kwantung army in World War II. He would retell the same story of a tank battle with Russian troops along the Manchurian border. When Mr. Honda dies, Toru is visited by Lieutenant Mamaya to bequeath an item to him. It is then we are thrust into a mystical wartime story where Mamaya relays how when he was a young soldier, he had to accompany a Japanese intelligence officer. And while across enemy lines, they were stopped and the officer was skinned alive. Mamaya only narrowly escapes, becoming trapped in a dry well much in the same as the one Toru occupies. When he does escape, Mamaya is left numb all over his body and is unable to possess a relationship with anyone and remains friendless and alone in the world. The well can be deconstructed in a number of ways. However, the most relevant is the well's symbolic nature to confrontation. Toru must confront himself to understand why Kumiko left. One could draw the comparison to Japan's unwillingness to confront its war crimes during World War II, namely with the mass murder of innocent civilians and the use of comfort women, which we hope to examine in another episode with Chang Rei Lee's A Gesture Life. Dan Carlin covers the pursuits of Japan's Kwantung army during World War II in his hardcore history podcast in a series entitled Supernova in the East. As he puts it, Unfortunately for all of them, there's a massive amount of karmic debt that the Japanese military here is acquiring that's going to have to be paid off at some point. It's fashionable these days to castigate the allied populations in the latter part of the Second World War for being so willing to inflict such crushing damage to the civilian populations of the Axis powers. But if allied powers had hardened hearts, by that point in the war, it's important to remember what happened in 1941 and 1942 to help harden those hearts in the first place. But what goes up must come down. The worm will turn and all these karmic debts will be paid in full, with interest. Outside of this, there is also the loss of Japanese culture in many senses. During and after the American occupation, Japan shifted into a westernized nation which much of the present day, including Toro's mostly inactive meager character embodies. The natural and unnatural world are at odds, 
and it seems the natural uses supernatural qualities to break into the world of the unnatural. Even though the book is comprised of three sections, there are two parts that stand out above all else. I like to refer to them as the Malta and Krita Kano in the Nutmeg and Cinnamon Akasaka epochs. For all its splendor and dreaminess, the novel falls away from the first epoch only to manifest itself in a disjointed fashion in its second epoch. Allow me to elaborate. Both halves seem as if they were written at distinctly different periods. Whether this is the case or not, or intentional, it comes off unbalanced in a few major respects. The clairvoyant sisters Malta and Creed Akeno lose their significance within the narrative for no apparent reason other than what one could assume Marikami's desire to introduce two additional characters, Nutmeg and Cinnamon, for the sake of more characters, or to open the plot to an extra layer. So rather than establishing and creating meaningful characters that could be fully realized throughout the entirety of the novel, we are left with two sets of characters that conflict with one another. You may think that both sets of characters fulfill a unique purpose in the narrative, or add to the mysticism of Marikami's dreamlike world. Maybe. However, let's try a mental exercise. Imagine Nutmeg's wealth, which could have easily been attributed to the Kano sisters, as well as Nutmeg's father, the zookeeper in Manchuria. I would argue the significance of the characters, their arcs, and connectivity of their paths would all align to create a more fulfilled plot with a greater payoff. However, I digress. Their emergence of worlds and the confrontation of the self should be celebrated as Wind Up Bird Chronicle opens a conversation for reflection, especially within a society that isn't necessarily keen on the idea of it. As Toru Okada said, it was a narrow world, a world that was standing still, but the narrower it became, the more it betook of stillness, the more this world that enveloped me seemed to overflow with things and people that could only be called strange. They had been there all the while, it seemed, waiting in the shadows for me to stop moving. As always, hit that like button if you like what we're doing. Subscribe for more videos on literature from your favorites to the plain obscure. Hit that bell if you want to be notified when videos drop. And leave a comment with your thoughts on this video along with suggestions for any books or authors you would like us to cover in future episodes. Until next time, keep reading.